so I was looking at Audible last week and I noticed they added in a bunch of books that you just have access to by virtue of having a subscription that you don't have to buy. They're just kind of there. And I was looking through them and I saw one title that jumped out at me, uh, the, Anatom the Anatomy of Fascism by Robert Paxton. And I was like, this is probably going to be very biased, but I have been wanting to read kind of a more comprehensive history of um, fascism and how it emerged. So I figured I might as well get it, give it a try. So I, I got it and I've been listening to it over the last week. This is an interesting case of not so much you can't judge a book by its cover, but you can't judge a book by its first chapter. So the first, like chapter or two of this book is complete garbage like they like he says a whole bunch of stuff that isn't true and that he later contradicts i don't know if the goal was to lay out all the myths like he starts off by saying big business funded hitler uh he says the only two fascist movements of note were in italy and germany um he just kind of goes through demonizing it and going through all this other stuff but eventually once you get past that and you go into the real meat and potatoes of the book, um, it's actually pretty good. He does do a pretty good history of, in particular, Mussolini's fascist party, but also the uh, National Socialist Party in Germany. He does talk about all the different fascist movements, why he thinks some succeeded and why he thinks some didn't. So the focus of the book is to largely ignore official ideology. Um, he kind of considers fascist movements to be catch-all and kind of pragmatic in character. And looking at any of the particular literature is not very helpful. In particular, a lot of the economic radicalism was never carried out. And a lot of fascist regimes or what's, what are often considered fascist regimes, even if they aren't really, purged a lot of the radicals once they took power. Um, a friend of mine, Torellian, once said something that I really think is a good way of describing this. The people who can get you power aren't the same people who keep you in power. And so it's kind of a necessity to do some massive purges if you're the member of some, if you're the leader of some sort of dissident movement, uh, be that Strausser or the Falange, or I can't recall what the fascist movement was in Portugal or the integralists in Brazil. In a lot of cases, what would generally be considered to be fascist movements, such as uh, the National Socialist Party or the Mussolini's Fascist Party, did purge kind of the extreme wing of the party. Um, and a number of conservative authoritarians also purged the more radical of the fascists uh, once they took power. So he goes through in a great detail the social, economic, and political conditions that gave rise to the success of um, the two major fascist parties. And the reason he kind of focuses on these two, as he points out, is while there were other fascist parties, most countries had at least one. Some of them are kind of not, you're, it's not really clear if you can consider them to be fascist parties, because some countries like France had a large far-right movement, but it was predated fascism, like you had Belonger, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, which was kind of like a proto-fascist movement. You had like Acta and Francois, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but which was kind of a more um, integral national Catholic movement. And you had um, Bonapartism and stuff like that. So it, fascism wasn't really useful to the French political discourse. Um, a lot of the fascist movements were just really, really LARPy, like the Iron Guard in Romania or the Arrow Cross Party. And they were just kind of, their nature made them politically marginal. Um, the, the black shirts in, uh, or the British fascist party didn't really have any appeal to a lot of the population. Um, also the political and social conditions weren't really condicative to the, um, to its emergence. My big issue is he doesn't talk about fascism in Japan. Now, there's a lot of debate as to whether the Imperial Rule Assistance Association and, like, the Imperial Way faction were fascist. I would say they, 
they cla they qualify if not fascist then a similar third position because if i was kind of talking about fascism i'd put it personally in the perspective of a broader uh range of third position uh kind of integralist nationalist movements so like if i was talking about it i would include peronism and bothism possibly Kamalism. It kind of depends um, how you want to define it. I would even put like the modern communist Chinese, the modern Chinese Communist Party and the Korean Workers Party within kind of what I consider to be third positionist parties that are kind of part of this umbrella. But his, like I said, his major reason why he groups it the way he does is they were the only two parties that came to power without outside influence and kind of near the end of the book when he talks about the other parties that came to power he states in a lot of cases the regimes that um, nazi germany set up were not really fascist or they were only nominally so and they tended to prefer just working with conservative authoritarians uh, like marshal Antonescu or admiral horthy than relying on unreliable um, political amateurs. From my understanding, even within Slovakia, while I think it was more fascist than some of the others, it was very much kind of a conservative authoritarian government. And uh, sometimes people were given like nominal positions of power, like Quisling, but generally speaking, they the, the Nazi party didn't make a huge effort to impose stable fascist regimes probably the most successful one was the utase uh he doesn't really talk about it but if you want to kind of cast the net a bit wider there was a movement called the conservative revolution or the revolutionary conservatives in germany that was not populist necessarily to the same extent fascism was but did kind of mix Kind of authoritarian conservatism with modernist ideas of technology modern economics and uh, modern administrative ideas which i don't think is necessarily the same as fascism but i think influenced probably franco and marshall antonescu and some of the more conservative uh, authoritarian regimes that popped up during this time period and as part of his thesis, he very much viewed the coming to power of the National Socialists or the Fascist Party in Italy as not being inevitable, as being the result of luck, um, the specific nature of the leadership uh, of the parties, the leadership of the country, the specific political situation. So to kind of talk about both Italy and Germany, uh, there was a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. Probably the first one is both countries felt that they had lost the Great War. Now, Italy was technically on the winning side of the Great War, but they hadn't really gotten most of the territorial concessions they wanted. I think they wanted, um, I think, Croatia, a lot more of the Adriatic coast. I'm not sure if they wanted Crete in some of the islands. They hadn't really gotten much colonial territory. I think Italy just felt that they had sacrificed a lot of blood and treasure and really had didn't have much to show for it. Likewise, we don't really need to talk about Germany as that's been covered elsewhere. So there was that issue. There was a big issue in that the Communist Party was very strong in both countries. Obviously, you had the Spartacus uprising and the German Revolution, which was kind of critical in finally bringing the end to Germany's rule in world, role in World War I and collapsing the old political system. I don't think there was any necessary, I don't think there was any inevitability that after World War I, the monarchy was going to disappear. I think there would have probably been a push for more democracy and things would have been pushed in a leftward direction. But I think it was really the German Revolution that sealed the fate of not only Kaiser Wilhelm, but the entire German political system. So Germany always had a very strong communist party, as did Italy. I think the one that had the most success in Western Europe was the French Communist Party, but I don't think it was a satellite of the Soviet Union in the same way the Italian or German one was. I think they kind of formally renounced Bolshevism or something. 
So they had a very strong communist party that continually tried to destabilize the situation. In particular, in Italy, one of the um, major ways the fascists would start to get kind of some steam is you'd had a lot of communist-inspired strikes, and I believe it was the Po Valley where the agricultural system was breaking down and the fascists came in and just started beating up farm workers and stuff and got them to go back to their jobs and saved um, one of Italy's big harvests. So you had that issue uh, with, with strong communist parties. The other issue politically was neither country was able to have anything resembling a functional government. You had a mixture of different parties, all of whom were mutually exclusive, and coalitions were more or less impossible. So in both Italy and Germany, you had a strong communist party, a strong socialist party, <clears throat> and a strong Catholic party. So those were kind of like the first three things, and I believe those were generally speaking the three largest in both countries. And within the Catholic parties, you had both right and left factions. In Italy, I think the right and left was about the same. The left of the party might have been stronger. But despite the fact that the um, Catholic parties, particularly in Italy, had a similar agenda in terms of economic issues and social reforms and land reform and stuff like that to the socialist parties, <clears throat> they didn't want secularization. They didn't want like the church to be removed from schools and stuff like that, whereas that was a non-negotiable for the socialist parties. And if this, if some of the kind of more moderate socialists tried to form a coalition with the Catholic parties, then you would get schism. So together they might have made up a majority, but that just wasn't really possible, uh, given that there were certain unreconcilable differences. Uh, then you had liberal conservative parties and there was a lot of kind of overlap between them the conservatives particularly within germany were never really reconciled or accepting of democracy um in some ways you can kind of view the forerunner of the national socialist party to be the ndvp or the national german people's party which was kind of the far-right party prior to the the nazis which was largely made up of militarists and the old aristocracy one of the reasons that the conservatives and nationalists, oh, sorry, one of the issues the conservatives and nationalists had leading up to uh, World War II is they were largely, I think particularly Americans and just anybody today from one of these countries doesn't understand how strong the class structure was. In Canada, we don't really have a class structure. And in America, there's like a bit of one, but it's it's nowhere near as prevalent. So the conservative parties, more so than any kind of what we would today consider ideology, were about defending the interests of the big landowners, big business, and the old nobility. <clears throat> and they really had, despite being theoretically kind of populist and nationalistic, their nationalism was, um, we need more for the upper class. So they really didn't have much appeal beyond that. The liberal parties had some success among the middle class, but they were once again a very class-based, uh, very urban-based phenomenon. So within this context, you have a whole bunch of parties, none of whom really appeals that much to the general electorate. Probably the only ones that had popular appeal beyond a narrow range was the Catholic parties, but they were sectarian. So the Catholic Center Party, I think, was often the largest or the second largest party for most of the Weimar Republic. But because Germany's not entirely Catholic, it was able to hold the balance of power, but never assume power. And you, there was not like enough of any particular faction to form a stable coalition. The conservatives, the conservatives and liberals couldn't form a coalition. Um, a lot of them refused to form a coalition for religious, in the case of Germany, or economic reasons with the Catholic parties. Uh, the Catholic party wouldn't form a coalition with the socialist parties who wouldn't form a coalition with them. So you have this scenario in which 
there's basically a period of complete political chaos and deadlock in both countries for the entirety of the post-World War I era. It's generally considered, though, that it was worse in Italy. Now, the interesting thing about Italy is the fascist party did not actually get that many seats. It ran as part of the national blocs in combination with some liberals and conservatives and got 19% of the vote, and similarly about 20% of the seats. What percentage of that was under Mussolini's control, I think, was about half. So the fascists really only had about 10% of the um, electorate uh, directly voting for them. They were not a particularly like huge party. They were big enough that they kind of had to be part of any coalition, but weren't really huge in the way the National Socialist Party would become. Um, he portrays the March on Rome as largely being a bluff, where Mussolini decided to act in time in a time of extreme government chaos. I think it was after the elections of 1921, no one was able to form a government, and Mussolini decided to roll the dice and refused to ally with another existing party and demand that the king personally made him uh, the prime minister. So they marched on Rome and the government at the time actually had put together a pretty large uh, number of what we were considered politically reliable soldiers. And it seemed like the government, if they were willing to stand up to Mussolini, could have used the army to put down the march on Rome and ended his career there. From, from my understanding, what happened was the king kind of balked at the last minute, and there's some theories behind this. One is that despite the seeming political reliability, since Mussolini's black shirts were mostly made up of veterans, the existing army would side with them. There was also fears that other um, members of the royal family who promoted, fa sorry, who promoted fascism would use the opportunity to launch a coup and dispose the king. And there is also the ever-present threat that if the chaos of dismantling Mussolini's fascist party would allow the communists and socialists to seize power. And the conservatives, generally speaking, saw Mussolini, because they weren't going to abolish private property, as being the better choice of the two. So Mussolini was made prime minister, although he more or less governed in a coalition for the first couple of years of the regime until all the parties started merging together into the National Fascist Party and the Communist and Socialist Parties were banned. To a certain extent, though, Italy did remain arguably a constitutional monarchy for a lot of the time Mussolini was in power. But it's kind of interesting because they didn't really have that large a percentage of the popular vote. I'm not trying to say that fascism wasn't popular in Italy. And if they hadn't have held free elections during the uh, 20s or later 30s, that they would have won a majority. But it, it, was, it is kind of interesting that a lot of it came down to a bluff. But then again, isn't that how all Italian politics going back to ancient Rome goes? In the case of um, National Socialist Party in Germany, it's a bit different. Hitler was a lot more reluctant to use violence in his com in his conquest for power. I think part of that was you had the cap push in the aftermath of World War One, in which uh, Dr. Cap and the um, Freikorps attempted a coup and to impose a conservative authoritarian state in which they were going to restore the Kaiser and turn back the clock. That, however, failed due to a general strike from the uh, communist and socialist parties. And this combined with the, and this combined with the experiences of the disastrous beer hall push made Hitler decide he was going to take it in kind of the slow lane. Now, something a lot of people tend to think is that big business funded Hitler which is not really true. Um, probably the more accurate one is the conspiracy theory, if it's even a conspiracy theory, is that the German deep state supported Hitler. That is um, the military uh, establishment and the various authoritarians either left over from the uh, Second Reich or who were just wanted the end of democracy, supported him from behind the scenes. 
Business, as in all societies, donated to all major parties just because they want to have decent relations with as many people as possible. I don't think they dominate, donated to the Communist Party, uh, though. But the National Socialists really didn't receive very much in the way of donations um, until 1932 and 1933 when they became the second largest and then largest party. And to kind of say that after the National Socialists had the dominant position in government that big business seeing the writing on the wall just started throwing money at them to say that was funding their rise to power is very disingenuous because of course big business is going to give money to people who have power to try to win their favor especially when you had strausser still running around and the radical wing of the party in which they were very scared would start nationalizing everything Germany kind of underwent the a similar crisis to what had happened with the um, Italian government, although Hitler was in a much, much, much better political position where it was impossible to form any coalition without the uh, National Socialist Party. And as with Mussolini, the prevailing conservatives tried to offer Hitler the symbolic position of vice chancellor. They tried to offer cabinet positions and that sort of thing. The um the German People's Party at this point in time was not like particularly large or powerful because a lot of its support had left it to go to the National Socialists. And eventually the deal that was brought together was a coalition government between the uh, Catholic Party, the German People's Party, which together was actually a majority of the population. I think that was 53% of the electoral vote. And that went significantly higher in the next election. So there's this meme that like Hitler didn't have a majority. And while theoretically that's true, because in 1933 election, I think they got like 41 or 42 percent of the vote. They were still in a coalition that gave them a majority and who voted for the Enabling Act. And even if uh, Germany had some sort of first past the post system, and 36% or 40% of the vote was enough to give them a majority of seats. I mean, so what? That's how the electoral system works. Like, it's it's kind of dumb to complain about it in, in retrospect. Oh, they only, um, they didn't actually win because of the popular vote within a country that where the popular vote doesn't really matter that much like Canada or the United Kingdom, where popular vote is very secondary to having um, the popular vote concentrated in certain areas, uh, high population areas, and being able to get it, the more concentrated it is, generally speaking, the better in first past the post systems. So it's kind of pointless. Um, and his attempt to explain kind of why the National Socialist Party was so successful was it and the National Fascist Party were the first kind of catch-all parties that it were trying to appeal to basically everyone. They offered concessions to workers. They wanted to preserve the property of the middle class and maintain order and prevent the communists from coming to power. They, they kind of deal with the business classes that they weren't going to confiscate their property. They were going to give them armament contracts and public work contracts and stuff like that. So they offered something to pretty much everybody within the society. And, and they, they were able to get a very broad base of support from all of that. Hitler also had a lot of luck in the form of the conservatives thought they could control Hitler, despite their own parties being a lot smaller. Um, like Hindenburg, Hugenberg, and Franz von Papen thought that they could co-opt Hitler and basically get him to do what they wanted. And that he would basically be the springboard for them retaking power, which is not what happened at all. And in my opinion, Hitler was rather smart during the Night of Long Knives for purging a lot of the politically liab a lot of the political liabilities and a lot of the radicals and just people like Strausser who were like they in Rome that really. Were, were kind of a net drain on the party now that it had gained power. And his large, largely he just kind of feels when the fascist parties were in power, 
um, they ruled in rather a rather pragmatic way. It was not particularly ideological. Um, in a lot of ways, the conservatives viewed it as being a continuation of their own policies because the regimes were generally socially conservative. While they were initially kind of anti-clerical, to a certain extent, they, particularly in the case of Italy, um, reconciled themselves to the existing church. And they managed to completely crush communism and socialism, preserving the property and interests of the middle working and upper classes. So their actual um, rulership of the countries was pragmatic. It was kind of a mixture of different policies. Uh, he points out that the actual number of police in Nazi Germany was something like one for every 10,000. The, the size of the secret police was not, has been really exaggerated. Um, and they were able to achieve a pretty high level of compliance from the general population without nearly as much state terror as is generally thought. Within Italy, there was not much in terms of state terror. Uh, he, he states that uh, during over the course of Mussolini's entire time in power, that only about nine people were actually sentenced to death. Now, doubtless, the fascist militias probably killed more people, but generally speaking, um, Mussolini's way of dealing with things is people were sent on a vacation to some kind of crappy town in southern Italy, which sounds pretty nice to me, or to like one of the islands, and they were kind of placed in internal exile, or the fascist militia would just beat you up and smash your printing press. But you didn't really have anything approaching what you saw in um, Nazi Germany, let alone within the Soviet Union, in terms of the amount of uh, destruction and, uh, like I said, state terrorism against the population. I think Mussolini tried a couple times to make a more totalitarian regime, uh, but Italians are kind of laid back. So when he was trying to do that, they just, I think there was like some national sport institution he tried to make to, to more directly involve the fascist party in people's private lives. But pe the Italians were just like, oh, cool, we have more days off to play soccer. And it just didn't really go anywhere. To my understanding, that's also kind of what happened in, in uh, Austria, where Austrians are more laid back than Germans. So when you had the fatherland front in power, they were nowhere near as um, brutal as the National Socialists were. They were certainly a, a conservative authoritarian government. They certainly did persecute political opponents, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they were a lot more laid back. It's interestingly, the, the National Socialist Party was not particularly violent, aside from uh, the Night of Long Knives and Kristallnacht, uh, prior to taking power, there was a couple circumstances where they tried to provoke communists into street battles to make it look like the country was collapsing. But generally speaking, Hitler was reluctant to use too much force for fear of uh, getting a uh, basically getting a crackdown or the conservatives viewing him as too much of a liability. In contrast, uh, the, the most violent fascist movement is generally seen as the Iron Guard or the Legion of St. Michael the Archangel in Romania, who is known for a lot of, state, of terrorism and political assassinations. And I think the Arrow Cross Party is also up there. But I think kind of what makes, um, he says, makes Germany and Italy interesting is in all other cases fascist movements were used as a tool of a uh, conservative authoritarian government as i said like uh, vargas or franco or salazar or marshal antonescu or admiral horthy to help them gain absolute power and they adopted aspects of fascism but generally speaking they were more interested in uh, a more kind of traditional form of one part of uh, single person rule uh, France was also like that under Marshal Patin, which for some reason is considered to be a fascist state, but I would argue Patin was more in kind of the um, vein of the traditional legitimist or Bonapartists and kind of a more traditional Catholic authoritarian integralist state than any sort of real fascist state. 
So hopefully that was interesting. I think I covered all the points uh, I had that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'd say the book is pretty good. Uh, I would just, if you're going to read it, just understand the first couple chapters are garbage. And I think he was trying to set up myths and then kind of go through and demolish them. But it's not written in a very clear or coherent manner. And it did almost make me put the book down. So... God bless and keep it edgy, my friends.